Hi everyone, my name is Holly Stoneberg and I'm the Education Program Coordinator for Portage Park District. And tonight we're gonna learn about crows and all the things that make them fascinating creatures. So like always, I'll pause here and tell you about our mission a little bit, but that QR code in the bottom will take you directly to our newsletter sign up. If you're not already on that sign up, I would highly suggest you do that. We, it comes out the first Thursday of every month and it has the park happenings, education programs, all the cool things that are going on in the park. Um, and you just are the first ones to know um, and get all the, the juicy details of park life. Um, so take a second and go ahead and sign up there. But to start, our mission is to conserve Portage County's natural heritage and provide opportunities for its appreciation and enjoyment. So um, my uh, the, the big takeaway, right, is to conserve, right? That's the whole point of what we're doing. Um, but my role here is to provide opportunities for its appreciation and enjoyment. So that's why we bring you these webinars. We usually do one once a month because we know that life is busy and it's not always easy to come to some park programs. So we want to give you some things that you can do on your own time. Uh, remember, these webinars are always recorded and posted on YouTube. So um, and we have a good selection up there now. So if you want to go back and watch a few, they're always there. Um, but I do thank you for joining me tonight. So let's get into it. Um, let's start with the crow basics, right? Their scientific name is Corvus brachyrhynchos, which means stout or short nose, right? And they are in the the corvid family, right? So if you think about the, the blue jays and the crows and the ravens and the magpies, all of those kind of strong, stout burrs that are kind of large with kind of obnoxious calls, right? Those are all in the corvid family. And they're also in the order Passeriformes, which are our perching birds. And we give them the word anisodactyl, which you can see in that picture there. It's the way their feet are formed. They're perching birds. So they have four toes, three in the front, front and one in the back. And that really allows them to hold on to stuff. So if you think about our songbirds and our crows and our jays, right? They're, they can grab onto stuff and just hang there, sometimes even sideways. It's because of the way that their feet are formed. And their range is all over. If you look at this map, they're present pretty much everywhere except for the deserts. Um, they're in Ohio all the time. Um, and what's cool about them is that their conservation status is secure, right? Um, a lot of times when we do these animal programs, we have to say, oh, they're declining or oh, they're endangered. But I don't have to say that with crows, which is cool. And in some cases, their populations are actually growing. So it's nice to see the other side of that sometimes. So when we talk about their size, they're pretty big birds, right? They're 15 to 19 inches. Their wingspan can uh, surprisingly be three feet wide, right? So that's a meter. <laughs> that's a pretty big wingspan for a bird. If you see them in the trees, you're going to notice them, right? It's not like the little warblers or chickadees that you kind of have to look for. They're, they're pretty obvious because of their size out there. And they're hefty, right? They're 15 to 22 ounces, which is over a pound. If you think about the size of a chickadee, a black cap chickadee weighs half an ounce. Okay, so compare that to these birds. They're, they're chunky little birds. They're a good size. And that's probably because of their feeding styles, right? They are opportunistic feeders and they're omnivores. And omnivores, as I'm sure you know, is a science word that just means they eat both um, plant and animal material. But they're, uh, the fact that they are opportunistic feeders uh, makes them really adaptable and they can be find and found in a variety of environments, right? Um, they like it out here in Portage County, right, where we have a lot of farmland because one of their main food sources is corn. But because their ability to eat everything, they've been found in urban and suburban environments and doing just fine because they'll eat fruit, they'll eat carrion or dead material, they'll pick through garbage, they like insects and spiders, they'll even raid other birds' nests and eat their eggs. And then if you leave your pet food outside, they'll eat that too. I think in this picture, he has a piece of popcorn. <laughs> so they are not picky eaters. And that's one of the things that helps them survive in a variety of environments because if there's something edible, they're going to find it. You might have heard the phrase, as the crow flies, and that really um, is true if you watch any crow flying around here, right? Their flight pattern is really direct and level with those slow, steady flaps. They, 
um, if you ever pick up your phone, at least on, on my phone, when I just ask Siri, you know, how far is Streetsboro? And she'll say five miles as the crow flies. It's because if you watch them, they go direct. There's no messing around with how the crows travel through the air. And they don't soar either, like we see our vultures and some of our hawks doing. They're going to get to where they're going, and that's it, right? They're not messing around. So these crows are highly social birds. Um, they, it's very rare to see them individually. And if you do, I suggest you look around because there's probably another one hopping around in the trees somewhere. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the phrase a murder, right? So that's what we call a group of, of crows. Um, the education team like to joke sometimes. So if we see um, a couple crows over there and a couple crows over there, we'll call it a double homicide, right? Just these <laughs> silly jokes we have. But um, they are highly social birds where you see them in groups most of the time. They have really strong family units and crows will mate for life. Um, and they maintain that family unit for a long time, meaning that up to five generations will be living together. So the parents will have offspring. Those offspring will... Um, and stay around, right? They're not going to leave like some other bird species. And they'll stay around to help raise the next generation of young. And they do that by protecting the nest or fixing the nest. Um, they'll clean out the nest. And sometimes they'll even bring the, the mother bird food as she sits on the eggs. So they have a really tight family unit as well. Um, and they have these roosting groups. So as winter is approaching, I'm sure you felt it earlier this morning, uh, maybe not so much tomorrow, but it's coming. Um, they're going to form these huge roosts that can be anywhere from 10,000 to sometimes even up to a million crows that join together. And they say they do that obviously for protection, but also for warmth and things like that. Because um, when you have families that stick to it together for generations at a time, it's really easy for them to clump together and form these roosts. Another thing that shows how social they are is the fact that they hold quote unquote funerals. So if one crow finds another crow that has died, it will kind of sound the alarm. So it'll make a lot of noise and bring in other crows and they'll start investigating and make more noise and bring in more crows. And they'll kind of try to figure out why the crow died so that they can protect themselves and figure out what hazard or what danger is potentially in the area. So that's their form of funeral. Right? Um, another thing that's funny about these family units is I'm sure you've all heard how crows can recognize faces and will hold grudges, and that's that's very much true, right? But um, one thing you might not have known is that they can hold on to these grudges for generations. I was reading an article by Audubon, and they were talking about this study that was put out by the University of Washington where researchers put on masks that resembled cavemen, and they went out and used nests in order to capture um, seven crows. They released them, of course, but the researchers then in the days following would walk across campus wearing those cavemen masks, and they would um, upset the crows. They would make their sounds and they would actually dive bomb the people wearing the, the caveman masks, which is interesting enough in itself, but they also found that over 10 years later, they would put on the masks and walk across campus. And not only seven birds that they caught, but multiple crows, more than seven, almost half, would dive bomb them as well. So it's like if you know your great aunt Myrtle has a, a grudge against someone, you're kind of in the family and you have a grudge against them too. Crows work the same exact way. So when we talk about reproduction, um, they're a little bit different than our other passeriforms. So if you think about passeriforms um, or our songbirds, some of them, right, they have these really pretty melodies that they're going to sing and it's going to ring for, through the forest or over the land and to, in order to attract a mate. But if you've ever heard a crow call, it's not, <laughs> it's not necessarily what we would call a pretty call. So they don't sing like our chickadees or other birds might do but they'll actually um, sing when they're really close to each other. And it's not necessarily a true song, but it's more like cooing and rattles and growls, right? The male may puff up his feathers and do a little display, but it's not something we see all that often because again, they mate for life. So we're not seeing them that too, that much. Um, so just to go over the sounds, here's the, the cause. I'm sure you've heard 
a crow before, but here's what they sound like. Oh, we've all heard a crow. And then here are some of the rattles they might make when they're um, attracting a mate. Right, just a, an odd little sound that they'll make. And then sometimes they'll kind of peck at each other's beak or maybe preen each other. Um, but yeah, they'll mate for light after that. Um, if one crow dies, they, they will go off and find another mate after that. Um, after they do that, they'll build the nest. And their nest, as you can see in this picture, it looks like a normal nest, right? It's made of sticks on the outside. But on the inside, it has this finer inner cup that they make with pine needles and animal fur. And it makes like a nice little resting spot. And then they'll proceed to lay between three and seven eggs between April and June. And then they'll just have that one brood for the year. And remember, the, the young will stay with them and help them raise the next generation. So one question that comes up a lot is the crow versus raven conversation. Oh, Heather said we can't hear the audio. <laughs> if we talk about um, crow versus raven here, um, the most obvious thing is that the ravens are larger, right? They're 23 to 27 inches in their wingspan. Remember, the, the crow's wingspan is three feet. Raven's wingspans are actually four and a half feet. And they're two to three pounds. They're bigger birds, right? And the way their feathers are arranged, they're a lot uh, fluffier. They look a lot fluffier, whereas the crows look a little bit more sleek, right? And then if you look at their tail, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but the crows have a fan-shaped tail and the ravens have more of a diamond-shaped tail, right? Um, so, um, what was I going to say about them? Oh, when we talk about ravens, when I learned about them earlier in life, right? If I saw a blackbird, you knew it was a crow right? We knew that ravens are more out west, and you're probably not seeing them here. But like all things, you can never say never. Um, ravens were actually extirpated from Ohio in the early 1900s, but in recent years, they've been making uh, reappearances. So even as, as early or as recent as like March of this year, there have been sightings of ravens like in Cuyahoga County. Um, but you can tell the difference between them. One, because it's so much bigger and their sounds are different. So remember, um, crows are going to do that caw, caw, whereas um, ravens have more of a croak, right? I remember I was um, hiking outside of Denver and I kept seeing all these crows. And then I was like, what is that other weird sound I'm hearing? And I finally stopped and looked and saw that it was what I thought were crows making that sound. And that's how I knew they were ravens because crows don't, just don't make that same sound. And um, we've all heard that that crows are super, super intelligent, right? Uh, even their intelligence has been compared to chimpanzees. Uh, there's a couple examples here that you might have seen videos on. If not, you can go to YouTube and, and <laughs> type up crow intelligence videos. But if you look at the picture here, um, some of them use tools to spear their food. So their beak is shorter compared to some birds, and it can only go so far. But they've been known to break off little twigs and kind of these toothpick-shaped um, pieces of wood, and they spear it into little holes where they're trying to get insects. So they've, they've learned that, hey, if I kind of extend this a little bit, I can get a nice reward. Same thing with this floating food experiment. Scientists had a crow and they put kind of like a graduated cylinder, which is a really long cup, and they put food in it where the crow could not reach it. But um, there was also water in it. But they the crows figured out that if they put stuff in the container, eventually that water level will raise and raise and raise and the food will float enough where they can reach it. So they're able to figure this out as long as they can see the cause and effect. And some local examples 
um, that today, uh, many of you know Jen White, she's our education and outreach manager. She told me these examples um, because, you know, when you're in the office, you get excited about all things animals. But if you didn't already think they were intelligent based on the caveman story and then the, the last slide, this, this slide is going to change your whole experience. So if you've ever been up to Stark Parks, they have um, their... Um, Animal Rehabilitation Center, and they have a crow there named Edgar Allan Crow, which is a great name for a crow. Um, but in his enclosure, they were finding that he kept having new things in his enclosure and his habitat. He would have these little trinkets and um, baubles, Jen called them, and they were wondering, you know, where did these all come from? But they figured out that he was taking bits of his scrambled eggs that they were giving him and trading them with crows, wild crows, outside of his enclosure, and they would bring him shiny stuff and toys in exchange for those eggs. So <laughs> that's fascinating, right? The fact that one that they can communicate kind of this bartering system, like, hey, I have food that you want, bring me a new toy because I'm in here, right? And then another thing that they observed is that he was ga gaining weight, which is weird when you have an animal that's on a diet where you give him all his food, right? They maintain it, they know exactly what he's getting, but so, for some reason he was gaining weight. And by all appearances, he seemed healthy, right? But again, they observed him and they, he found that the fruit that they were giving him, he would bury it and that fruit would attract insects. And then he would eat the insects, which are of much higher protein value than the fruit. So he was putting on weight because he was uh, in a way hunting himself, um, higher protein, more nutritiously packed foods, which is incredible. And um, as far as I know, Edgar Allan Crow is still up there, so you can go visit him in Stark Parks. Another story, um, the story of the crow and the bread. This is from Jen's father, actually. So he was working outside, and um, he saw crows come over, and there was a loaf of bread on the ground. And a crow would take a piece and go, and then this one crow came, and he took a piece but what's interesting is that her dad observed that the crow found a, went away for a while, found a piece of paper, came back, put the piece of paper on the bread, and then laid a rock on the piece of paper. And he would take a little piece, and he'd fly away. And then he'd come back, uncover it, grab a little piece, cover it up, and fly away. And eventually, he kept doing this until the piece was small enough that he could carry the whole chunk away. So if you think about that, what was he doing? He was hiding that piece of bread under that piece of paper, keeping the rock on it so the paper didn't fly away, so that other birds or maybe other um, organisms wouldn't see that the bread was there and he could have it all to himself. So the fact that there's other organisms out there thinking at this high a level, it's wonderful, right? The animal kingdom, it truly is magical. So hopefully we just increased your appreciation of crows that much, right? Yeah, Heather, are they sweet? <laughs> I mean, I knew they were smart, but these examples, the more and more you read about crows, it's, they're incredible, right? I gave them a crown because I thought they were, <laughs> right? They're, they're incredible. And then here, um, we get to rainbow crow. So um, I do not claim to be indigenous, right? I don't know a whole lot about the indigenous cultures of the area, um, but this is a story that I read when I was a little girl, and it really stuck with me, and it kind of changed the way that I view crows, because if you think about them compared to the songbirds, um, right, they're not as pretty, they're kind of drab from a distance, they're all one color, and um, they they make that caw, caw sound, right, which compared to our other songbirds, it's not, it's not that pretty, um, but I came across this story called Rainbow Crow by the uh, Lenape people, and they're um, indigenous people that were from like the eastern U.S. in Canada. So I figured we'd end tonight uh, with a story. So um, just bear with me. It's not that long, but I hope it, it um, increases your appreciation for them as well. Okay, so... Long, long ago, before our Lenape ancestors walked the earth, the weather was always warm and the animals lived in happiness. Then one day, the earth suddenly became cold and white, sparkling flakes fell from the sky, covering the earth with its white softness. The animals, seeing snow for the first time, were not afraid. Soon, the snow grew deeper and the mouse disappeared. All that could be seen was the tip of his tail, and the other animals began to get worried. 
Then the rabbit disappeared. All that could be seen were the tips of his ears, and by now the animals were really worried. So the animals met in council, gathering together in a clearing deep in the forest to discuss the situation. They decided that what was needed was for a messenger to travel up to the home of the creator and ask him to stop the snow. They asked among themselves, who was willing to make such a journey to the twelfth heaven, that distance dwelling place of the creator? The possum said, the owl is the wisest. Perhaps he should be the one to go. But no, the animals whispered, he might get lost in the light of day. So owl shouldn't go. Then the beaver said, perhaps the raccoon should go. No, the animals argued. He might follow his tail instead of his nose, so raccoon should not go. Then the skunk said, perhaps the coyote should go. No, the animal shouted. Coyote is clever and loves to play tricks. He might chase the clouds or swallow the wind, so coyote should not go. Then the animals made all kinds of noise. They screeched and howled and hooted and growled because they couldn't decide who should make the journey to the dwelling place of the creator and ask him to stop the snow. In the meantime, the snow got deeper and deeper. The small animals climbed on top of the taller animals so that they wouldn't disappear. Just as the animals were in their greatest despair, from the top of a tall tree, the rainbow crow flew down among them. In the sweetest voice they had ever heard from a bird, rainbow crow said, I will go, I will go. The animals were so happy to have a messenger that they sang many songs of praise to him. Then rainbow crow flew high up into the sky, above the snow and the winds, beyond the clouds, the moon and the stars. For three days he flew, until at last he arrived in the twelfth heaven, the dwelling place of the creator, but the creator was too busy to notice him. So the rainbow crow began to sing. Upon hearing the singing, the creator stopped to listen. Never before had he heard such a sweet voice singing or such a beautiful song. Upon seeing rainbow crow, the creator said, such a gift of song you have given me. Now I give a gift to you. Tell me what you would choose to have. Rainbow crow knew that far below on earth, the snow was getting so deep that soon all the animals would disappear. So he asked the creator to stop the snow. The creator replied, No, I cannot stop the snow, for the snow has a spirit of its own. When the snow spirit leaves the clouds to visit with his friends, the wind spirit, the snow will stop, but earth will still be cold. So Rainbow Crow asked the creator to stop the cold, but the creator said, No, I cannot stop the cold. All I can do is give you the gift of fire. Fire will keep you warm and will melt the snow so that your friends will be content until warm weather returns. The creator picked up a stick and set it on fire by sticking it into the sun. Then he handed it to Rainbow Crow saying, I will give you this gift only once. Now hurry, fly back to the earth before the fire goes out. So off flew Rainbow Crow. On the first day, he was flying down to the earth. Sparks from the fire burnt and darkened his tail feathers. On the second day, the fire burned brighter and the stick grew shorter and all of Rainbow Crow's feather became blackened with soot. On the third day, the stick of fire was so short and the fire was so hot that smoke and ash blew into his mouth and his voice became cracked and hoarse. Caw, caw, he croaked. Upon returning to the clearing in the forest where Rainbow Crow had left the other animals, they were nowhere to be seen. Only the tops of the tallest trees were above the snow. So Rainbow Crow flew down close to the snow, and around and around he went until the fire had melted the snow and his animal friends were safe. The stick of fire that Rainbow Crow had brought to earth as a gift from the creator became the grandfather of all fires, and for this all the animals gave thanks to him. They danced and sang songs, praising Rainbow Crow. But Rainbow Crow flew alone to a distant tree where he wept, for now he was no longer beautiful and could no longer sing sweet songs. His rainbow-colored feathers were gone forever. When the snow spirit emptied the clouds and joined the wind spirit, the snow stopped. Crow was still weeping. No longer was he rainbow crow, but just a plain black crow. Alas, crow is what he has been called ever since. Now the creator heard crow in his despair and came down from the sky. When he saw crow, he said, Soon man will appear on earth. He will take the fire and be master of all but you. For being so brave and unselfish, I now give you the gift of freedom. Man will never hurt you, for your meat tastes like fire and smoke. Man will never capture you, for your beautiful voice is now crackly and hoarse. 
Man will never value your feathers because your rainbow colors are now black, but your black feathers will shine and reflect all the colors. If you look closely, you will see. Crow looked, and he saw many tiny rainbows shining in his black feathers, and so he was satisfied. The creator returned to his dwelling far above the sky, and Crow returned to his friends in the forest, happy and proud that he was now just a black crow with shining feathers full of tiny rainbows. So, um, I don't know about you, but I thought that when I was younger, that was a beautiful story. I still do. Um, just the the unselfishness and the, the way that the crow became the crow, right? Um, and if you look now at crows, right, if you look very close to their feathers, you can see they kind of have this greenish rainbowish tint to it. So the next time you hear a crow cawing and you think, you know, it's a funny sound, then just think of that story and maybe we'll <laughs> appreciate them a little bit more. But um, I hope you enjoyed that story. And that's uh, the end of our presentation this evening. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if you want to throw them in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, but other than that, I hope you have um, a wonderful evening and thank you for joining me today. Ah!